It's good to be back and step into this six-part sermon series and worship series. It's not just about the sermons that will be preached over the next six Sundays, and we are blessed over the next six Sundays with the voices of Heather Giffen, Reverend Giffen is here, uh, with Reverend Joanna Samuelson, Dr. Amy Acton, and Emily Corzine, Reverend Corzine. And so in those, in those weeks of August, we'll hear from some amazing voices. But this came about because the right Reverend uh, Jeffrey Rothorn, Bishop Rothorn, who was, Sebi, a Gladden lecturer here at First Church, and his wife, Anne, have put together a remarkable book called God's Good Earth. That's where we got the series title. <laughs> so, um, God's Good Earth. And it's a, it's a book of prayers and litanies and, um, and hymns for all creation. And they asked us, as one of 15 congregations across the world, to participate in using the resources that they developed. So we're blessed to be a part of this. And uh, the blessing comes from all of us sharing in the resources and growing from them. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. In God's good earth, praise and prayers for creation, Jeffrey and Anne Rothorn open with these words. At the beginning of the biblical story, one thing is made very clear. There is an inseparable connection between humans made by God in God's image and the earth which God has created. And because we as humans have all come into being in the same way, we all have an inseparable connection as the human species. Although we speak different languages, belong to different variations of skin colors and nations and cultures and traditions and beliefs, we are all bound together as one, just as we are bound to our common home, God's good earth. We are created to be in communion with each other. That's how God made us. We are created to be in communion with the earth and all creatures, great and small. It seems so simple. It seems so clear. It's come to us from the beginning. It seems obvious. This relationship between each one of us and all of us is one to one another, and all of creation should be a relationship that lifts up the best and the most celebrated parts of all that we are. And where there is brokenness, we are called to love one another into wholeness and turn to every living thing with care. Over 500 years ago, in the 16th century, St. John of the Cross got it. He got this. He wrote, all the creatures, not the higher creatures alone, but also the lower, according to that which each of them has received in itself from God, each one raises its voice in testimony to that which God is. Each one, after its manner, exalts God, since each one has God in itself. Each one raises its voice in testimony. Each one exalts God, because each one has God in itself. Nailed it, St. John of the Cross. So how do we get from in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth in Genesis 1. And in that beginning, from God who saw that everything that God had created was good and then gloriously celebrated all this goodness through the chapter of Genesis that gives us this story, how did we get to the place we are today? How did we get from glory to gory? How did we get from good to turning on each other and creation? How did we get from beautiful to blaming, from special to shaming? God who created us good didn't do any of this. We can't blame God. We got here on our own. 
by turning life in harmony with one another and with the earth into camps with pitched tents and pitched forks that turn on each other and live in fear and disunity with God and self and humanity and creation. Instead of the moral arc of the universe bending towards justice, it seems like it has bent toward mutual destruction of all that God has made that is good. Sometimes the journey from the beginning cries out in clear and dramatic ways when it gets off line. Wars and famines, pandemics, floods and fires, tsunamis, tornadoes and hurricanes, they all are very clear about destruction. But sometimes there's a whisper. Sometimes there's a slight change in the wind. A missing creature who was once here among us, who is now gone. Ten days ago, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature placed the migratory monarch butterfly on its red list of threatened species classified now as endangered. Habitats lost, climate change, pesticides, invasive species have all been a part of bringing this about. There was no headline six years ago when a, head, when a winter storm in central Mexico in March 2016 killed up to 40% of the monarchs in an overwhelming freeze in the colonies in central Mexico. Overall, the population has declined 72% in the past decade alone. The monarch, which was a part of our gardens, a part of our growing up, a part of our summer's past, is facing a critically uncertain future. More than 320 species have died over the past millennium, a rate of one species every two years, gone every two years. The endangered list estimates that 32% of the world's populations across all species and ecosystems are dwindling. Species are now becoming extinct at at least a thousand times faster than they would have without human contact. While the human species is expanding exponentially and as we know, is having trouble taking care of our own. Populations of wild animals have declined by more than two thirds since 1970 while the human population has more than doubled in the past 50 years. Just to remind you, on God's good earth, the top 11 creatures on the endangered species list are all animals we know, animals that we find in our children's books, that we go to the zoo to see. From 11 to 1, they are these, the polar bears, the sea turtles, Asian elephants, tigers, rhinos, whales, chimpanzees, vaquitas, which are porpoises or dolphins, leopards, sharks are number no, sharks are number 10, and the most threatened species still on the planet are penguins. Going back to the beginning, we need to remember that all creatures, great and small, make a contribution to our entire ecosphere and our life together. To lose one flower, one grain of wheat, one tree, one butterfly, one bird, one by one, all after one another, creates a tremor that leads to tremendous pressure on the entire ecosystem of God's good earth. Orthodox leader and ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew I of Constantinople wrote recently, responding to the environmental crisis is a matter of truthfulness to God, to humanity, and to the created order. It is not too far-fetched to speak of environmental damage as being a contemporary heresy or a natural terrorism. We have repeatedly condemned this behavior as nothing less than sinful. For humans to cause species to become extinct and to destroy the biological diversity of God's creation, for humans to degrade the integrity of the earth by causing changes in its climate, 
by stripping the earth of its natural forests or by destroying its wetlands, and for humans to injure other humans with diseases by contaminating the earth's waters and lands and air and life with poisonous substances. All of these are sins before God, before humanity, before the world. The end. In the midst of this, I believe, along with Patriarch Bartholomew, that the church is a special agent of change in the midst of all of this. I believe in hope. I saw a billboard recently just outside of Chapel Hill as we were coming back from the coast in North Carolina. It said, hope cannot be canceled. I believe that's right. I believe that hope can never be canceled. I have witnessed Christians and churches finding simple ways to serve the earth and the poor. For many years, our gentle and clear Sacred Earth Committee here at First Church has been advocating for and caring for the earth all around us and beyond our Cathedral of Hope. So to all of you connected to Sacred Earth, thank you from the depths of my heart for being our witness for peace and justice. Chris Brandt has planted a beautiful garden in memory of her mother, which is a favorite spot for all the bees and for the little rabbits, one I saw this morning going in there, because there's not many places in downtown Columbus where they can land and be at peace. Now our gardening group at the church has stepped up to care for the earth all around us and has made this so beautiful. So thank you, thank you, thank you all. While the government has sought to squash the limits and voice of the actions of the Endangered Species Act over the last couple of years, through advocacy action, Christians have come together through the United Church of Christ and the Religious Campaign for Forest Conservation and Target Earth and the Evangelical Environmental Network to save the earth, opposing toxic waste dumps near homes of the poor or in the land and rivers around us. And through protection, I've been inspired by the Quakers in Costa Rica who have bought acres and acres of the rainforest and preserved it, now making some of the largest rainforests in the world. And the Eden Conservancy Project which has gone into Belize and done the same, saving thousands of acres of rainforest. In their words, they have set up biological corridors for endangered species and have saved hundreds of thousands of endangered creatures. And coming down to each one of us, we can all evaluate ourselves and our personal consumption and personal action choices day by day so that each of us can care for one another and God's good earth more fully. That's how we can be part of turning this around, by looking inward and saying, this is something I can do. Today and every day, we as people of faith can pray and act. We can become more informed and more responsive. A number of years ago, I preached a sermon in which I was trying to give some practical ideas of what somebody could do for environmental action. And I mentioned that in order to cut down the water flow, you could put a brick in your toilet. It was just an idea, it was just part of a sermon. That Sunday afternoon, I got a call from one of the kids in the church, and she said, Reverend Tim, I've looked around our house, we don't have any bricks here. And I said, I'll be right over. So I took a brick over from our backyard and gave it to her. A couple hours later, she called and she said, Reverend Tim, I need a couple more bricks. We had more than one toilet. And so I hurried back over, and by the way, I think, I mean, it's been a couple years, but I think I never mentioned it to Susan, so if you could let me get home first and say something to her, I'd rather tell her myself. See, there are simple things that we can do to reduce, reuse, and recycle. There are things that we can do to live and work in this world more cooperatively. We can cut down on consumption, and we can reuse rather than throw things away. And these are things that many of you do all the time. We can recycle everything possible. We can volunteer for cleanups in our community or organize some ourselves, educate ourselves and others. And in terms of conserving water, I want us to think about this a lot. The earth is 75% water, but only 33% of it is fresh water. And wait till you hear this. Only 1.2% of the fresh water on the planet can be used for drinking. 
since most of the fresh water is locked up in glaciers and in ice caps and in permafrost or buried deep below the earth. So we have to really watch everything we use with the water and save essentially. Choose sustainable products over throwaway products. Again, use less practice or pr plastic, use uh, recycled shopping bags, use long-lasting light bulbs. All of these things we know, but we don't always practice. All of these things add up. And while we can do these things, one of the best things we could do is plant more trees and not cut down the ones that are there. While all of these things are clear and practical, we also know it's going to take more than that to turn this around, right? It's going to take a massive dedication to alterna alternative energy sources and more. While in Europe and the Middle East this summer, we saw wind turbines in the desert and built in water in the Mediterranean Sea. They actually had turbines in the water solar fields throughout Bavaria and in Jordan. There's nothing like the use of solar power in a barren desert in the middle of Jordan. In Costa Rica years ago, Susan and I saw how growing coffee beans in their natural rainforest can happen effectively and well. When we talk about fair trade coffee, that's where it's coming from. It's coming from plantations that are doing this effectively and well. We also saw stripped land that was cleared off so that coffee could be grown there. And when we walked those miles through the coffee plantation, it was like being in a rainforest and harvesting coffee in the midst of that. One practice destroyed the earth and habitats. One practice sustained the earth and habitats. We can make choices about which coffee we buy. So here at First Church, we have Don George, who has shown us time and time again how we can buy fair trade coffee. This is not a sales pit, but we have it being sold here because we believe in this. It will take our investments in ingenuity, all of them, to turn this around. And we have some of the greatest minds and committed spirits in this effort right here in our church. I mentioned the Sacred Earth Committee. In addition, we have Greg Bazell and Sam Spofforth, Catherine Hope Cunningham, and again, Dawn, and so many others in our congregation who are not just practicers or thinkers about this, but are warriors, protectors, and givers for the earth through all that they do to dedicate their lives to saving God's good earth. They live and breathe hope every day. Thank you very much. Presented over 500 years ago with the question, what would you do if Jesus came back to earth tomorrow? German theologian and great Protestant reformer Martin Luther answered, I would plant a tree. There's something wonderfully pure and hopeful in those words. He understood that tending and caring for God's good earth was a high act of spiritual worship, maybe the highest act of all. It was an act of faith. It was an act of love. To hurt the earth is to hurt the poor and hurt those that we say we love. Conversely, every time we save a section of the rainforest or clean up a creek and river near us, recycle another bottle or put solar power on our homes or places of work, or say no to frivolous purchases or put a brick in a toilet tank, we are saving God's creation and caring for God's good earth. In the beginning, God created. We are far, far from the beginning now but we don't want to be too close to the end. God is counting on us now and for years to come to be that creative force in care for God's good earth. And when we do, God will most certainly echo some of the first words that God ever gave us in the book of Genesis. This is good. This is good. Amen.